thoughtful and discussion ready for you tonight. Thank you for participating and engaging. Um, we are here tonight to acknowledge the scope uh, of the work and impact of arts education on young people, on learning, on civics, and on citizenship. We're here to talk about young people in the arts, in the audience, and as participants in community arts education and in educational programming with, it, with the arts. This town hall is specifically centered around elevating, amplifying, and investing in arts education in schools across 435 congressional districts. I am here uh, because of the arts education that I received in Chicago. Chicago is rich. The vocabulary of the city is rich with museums and theater and opera and dance and visual arts. And it is so integral to our learning. Uh, and I went to a public school that you can't leave Chicago public, the Chicago public school system without having been impacted by the Field Museum, uh, the Art Institute, uh, the Lyric Opera, uh, and so on. And, and I know that's true for, for many of the people here, not Chicago specifically, but you are impacted by the arts. I think the, the latest study, uh, Jonathan Schmidt Chapman, who runs Theater for Young Audiences USA, did a study with the NEA, and I think the percentage is 68% of all young people who uh, engage in the arts as young people end up becoming uh, patrons of the arts later in life. And another way to think about that, because being an arts hero is uh, one of the main lenses we uh, look at the arts uh, sector and the creative economy through is economics. Another way to say that is 68% of all young people who engage in the arts as young people become consumers of arts and culture later in life, which is important because art is labor. And uh, one thing we know, particularly as educators, we are part of a larger industry. Art and arts and culture is an industry, not a cause. Um, I wanna let everyone know before we get started, before I introduce everybody, that we are being recorded. So if you don't wanna be recorded, feel free to turn your camera off. Um, which you can do if you hover your cursor over your uh, square and see the three little dots, you can stop video up there. Or if you go down to the bottom bar, there should be a little camera icon that says stop video and you can do it there. So those are your options. So that's my exit, that's my exit sign speech. Um, so with that, I wanna introduce our incredible panel tonight and start with Dr. Jennifer Katona, president of Three Looms and uh, creative, sorry, forgive me. Uh, I don't have commas in the right place, so I'm going to do that again. Tonight, we have Dr. Jennifer Katona, President, Three Looms Creative Education Consulting, Michael J. Bobbitt, Executive Director of Mass Cultural Council, Dr. Denny Wolf, Principal Researcher at Wolf Brown, and moderating our panel tonight is the one and only, the singular, Freddie Walker Brown, actress, director, writer, and teaching artist, passionate teaching artist. She's best known for creating the role of Joanne Jefferson in the Pulitzer Prize winning musical Rent, which celebrates its 25th anniversary this year. Most recent acting credits include HBO's Search Party, directing Bob Stewart's Let the Chips Fall Where They May, a disturbing look at the post-COVID world produced by Out of the Box Theatrics in association with Holmdel Theater Company, and her original play, Hashtag Rent Stories, which will be a part of the Holmdel Theater Company's 2021 season. In terms of arts education, her latest student project, The Doo-Wop Zone, is a movie musical parody of The Twilight Zone, which will premiere on Easter Sunday. Miss Freddie is a proud arts worker and advocate of arts education. She is the creator of the Professional Skills for Actors series, a comprehensive course on the business of acting, something I wish I had in my education as an undergrad. The single, It Took a Law to Make Me Human from her new album, one hashtag One People, One Planet will drop in the spring of 2021. And with that, Freddie, it's all yours. Thank you. Oh, thank you all for being here. Um, arts Ed is a passion of mine. I am a lifelong arts worker. Uh, I've, I've held every possible job in this industry. I've been an usher, a dresser, a wardrobe mistress, a company manager, an actor, a writer, a director, a producer, and now a teaching artist. And I'm not sure that that's everything, but I owe all of that to the people who taught me, uh, starting with my mother, who is 100. She's right in that room over there. 
She was an elementary school teacher for 42 years. And she taught me most of what I know about being a human being. And at 100 years old, she's still teaching me every single day. Uh, I come from a long line of educators. My great grandfather was emancipated uh, after the Civil War. And one of the first things he did was open up a church that had a school in it. And, um, you know, it was illegal at that time for him to even know how to read, let alone teach. He was risking his life to do it. So my family instilled in me a deep respect for the art of teaching, as well as the gift of knowledge. And sadly, it seems to me that knowledge is no longer looked on as the gift that it is. And somehow we've shifted our concentration to results as opposed to instilling the love of learning as a lifetime skill. So uh, unlike our illustrious panel, I am not an education professional uh, or, or expert. I'm a storyteller, I'm a professional storyteller. That's what I do. I tell the human story for a living, but that has taught me that story is incredibly important to human beings. It is how we communicate and not only how we communicate as a species, but it's also how we learn. Arts education saved me, it saved my life. Like, like so many of the kids I teach, I found myself in that first high school musical. And like so many others before me and after me, I came to New York to fulfill my dreams. And the fact that not only I, but four other people from my own high school, same high school, one of them in my very class, we all came to New York. We all made it to Broadway, all of us. One of us is currently the king of cabaret in New York. And we are all still making a living in the arts as working actors and the odds of that are astronomical, but we owe it all to those incredible teachers, Georgia Schofel and Leontine Meyer, the drama teacher and the music teacher respectively. I too went to a public high school. I went to a public high school, but it might as well have been a performing arts school. I mean, under those two women, we had three full choirs, four bands, a bunch of satellite singing groups. We had magicals and barbershop and jazz quartet. We did full two, uh, two full musical productions every year and a play. Uh, we had concerts, we, we toured as the concert choir, we toured grade schools and nursing homes and all kinds of places. And we competed and we brought home as many if not more trophies and accolades and awards and money for our school than the sports kids. Um, so the value of arts education cannot be overstated, certainly not by me. And I am very, very proud to teach it. I'm very proud to teach my craft to the next generation of arts workers. I have seen it save the lives of so many young people who are struggling to find their voice just like I was. And I have learned that a lot of that struggle comes from feeling like they don't fit into the mold that has pre been prepared for them. Uh, our current education mold, it's a one size fit all factory model that for me never was the way to teach. And it was designed for an economic paradigm that no longer exists. And the gaps in that system widen exponentially every day. And COVID has shown the brightest of all lights on that situation. I have also learned that the art of teaching is contingent on the love of learning. And a great teacher is always learning. So I'm hoping that tonight we come together and learn from each other and we learn how to teach again and how to truly serve our children, the next generation, and how we can really prepare them for the day that they assume the mantle of responsibility that falls on all adults and how we can inspire them to be happy, healthy, active people who are contributing members of society. And I firmly believe that arts education must play a major role in the education of the future, pun very much intended. And it is my pleasure and my honor to moderate this panel for the good folks at Being Arts Hero tonight. So I hope that we will all learn something and be inspired to lead. And with that, I will turn it over to the great, to Dr. I'm sorry. It's so beautiful. It's oh, so beautiful. Thank you, is that gold? Yes. Oh, thank you so much. I want to introduce you now all to Dr. Jennifer Katona. Uh, she is the president and um, founder of Three Looms Creative Education Consulting. She's currently working as the director of arts education for a Title I school district. 
She is the former founder and director of the graduate program in educational theater at the City College of New York, where she oversaw the certification of pre and in service theater teachers and training of non certified theater educators, something I didn't even know you could study in school. <laughs> she is an arts ed advocate, a curriculum writer, a teacher, a mentor and a school reformer. Uh, a true arts hero and her work, her work, it's very appropriate that she's first, her work focuses on the use of arts integration as school reform and transforming school curricula, instruction and assessment practices. Her work focuses around the ideas of how we can make learning more engaging for students and teachers and helping teachers find ways to have their students get an emotional connecting, connection to their content. And with that, Dr. Jen Katona. Take thank you away. so much. Thank you so much, Freddie. I just want to take a moment and thank Be an Arts Hero for hosting tonight, especially to Aaron and Sonia and Matt. And thank you so much, Freddie, for framing this evening with such passion. You started by talking about your first teacher and your mother. And it so happens that my first theater teacher, who is my mother, is also on this call tonight. She is a theater teacher of over many years, I won't say, out of Massachusetts. So <laughs> hi, mom. Uh, and to all of you for being here tonight, I know it's it's late and thank you for your continued commitment to arts education. Um, I'm gonna start tonight, I have some slides, Aaron. Thanks so much. Again, I'm not sure where everybody is coming into this conversation from, so I just wanna start with uh, setting the stage. Uh, so pre-COVID, back into the school year 1920, uh, arts education was always at risk of being cut. Those of us who've been in the field for a long time know that there was so much more work to be done around how to make sure that our students are getting the three prongs of a strong arts education. They're getting skilled arts instruction by certified arts teachers. They're getting access to arts integrated as their instructional practice. And they're having access to teaching artists, cultural field trips and getting out of their buildings to see uh, professional examples of their art. There was still a lot of work to do around that uh, when we hit COVID a year ago. When COVID began, many of our schools started to eliminate some of their programming uh, around safety concerns, particularly singing and instrumental music, around classroom concerns, sharing of resources. And now as we look ahead to the, the next school year, uh, once again, we are facing a major crisis. So if we were optimistic to think that in our pre-COVID time, we were at about 60%, um, and these numbers are not accurate, uh, we now are probably about half of that. So it's a real urgency that we are having this um, discussion tonight and that all of you are here and really thinking about how to advocate in the right ways and to the right people so that arts education is maintained in our schools. Um, the next slide, please. Great, so I wanna just name the problem, right? So right now in public school districts, um, char charter schools, all, all, all various levels of, of education, the major conversation that's being had right now is around learning recovery or often known as learning loss. Um, trying to reframe a little bit that we have to recover some of our learning. And the major problems that your school leaderships are facing are lack of time. Math and literacy are going to be the two areas that we're going, they're, they're focused on right now. And they're looking on how they can maximize math and literacy support. There is another SEL crisis that's happening right now, which is our students, you can see from my image, have been locked and loaded into their screens. So that's either for our remote learners, our hybrid learners, or if they have gone into the classroom, unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, our students are going into buildings and still on computers for the majority of their day. Because of noise, just basic um, function of having computer screens, oftentimes classrooms are dark because they have to have the lights off so we can see the screens. We have to talk in quiet voices so the teacher can hear everybody at home. Uh, and there's a lot more independent work because quite frankly, that's, that's just a bit easier on the, the hardship of the teachers right now. And we're keeping physical distance. So small group work just isn't happening right now, right? We're, and um, all those great collaboratives are not happening. So that's, that's kind of the problem we're in right now, facing learning loss and how are we gonna do learning recovery when we come back. Next slide, please. And so naming the solution, arts integration. I wanna make a point to say that if you were around in 2001 in this work when No Child Left Behind came around, a focus on literacy and math was also at the top of the talking points. And at that time, arts integration was kind of, um, it's the best way to get any kind of arts instruction in. 
When I talk about arts integration in this context, I'm talking about it as an instructional practice. So I still believe very strongly that skill-based arts instruction needs to happen, and we will advocate for that over there. But if we're talking about the issues that schools are having right now around how to maximize their time and everything I laid out in the other slide, arts integration is the best kind of bang for your buck. Uh, we get to combine multiple content objectives to maximize the time. We can cover science, social studies, math, and literacy. Uh, you can take a 90 minute block and we can do transdisciplinary work. We can focus on collaboration so we can counter that independent work that students have been um, asked to do during the past year. Eye contact, which is a major part. I see so many kids now not sure, even just some actual eye problems now um, around how to focus and refocus. So just getting students back into a circle and making eye contact with one another. Uh, vocal projection, having to wear masks. And now students have gotten very used to either just talking with their earbuds in or into a screen or with a mask. So really trying to uh, reinvigorate their vocal projection skills. Project-based learning, again, which will maximize our time personal human interactions and getting into small collaborative groups. And Denny and Michael will speak more on the next two bullets, but I just wanna highlight that the arts, while we also have the learning loss and learning recovery issue, SEL is going to be a big part of the recovery of schools post COVID and the arts inherently bring out the SEL connections. The other major piece that is inherent in arts integration work is the equity of access to the learning. So we know that students will be coming back to school at various levels and entry points. So a third grader, for example, if they were supposed to hit a certain mark, uh, we don't know what those students are going to be at. Um, 30 kids in a class could be 30 different starting points. But if you show a piece of artwork to a group of students and say, what do you see? What do you notice? There is a leveling of the playing field. So there's an equity of access to their learning and everybody gets that, gets to make their own, um, their own path in how they want to approach the work and the teacher can use that as an assessment. Uh, those are the, you can take the screen off, Erin. Great, I'm gonna toss it back to you, Freddie. Well, I am going to ask you a question, am I there? Yes, am I, you are. Am I on yet? You are. Oh, hey, here I am. Hey, hi everybody. So uh, the question that we're asking today, because obviously this is all about advocacy and, and action. So what can folks here do with the information that you just gave them? What action can they take and where would you, prefer they direct their advocacy? That is a great question and I have some answers for you. So, right. <laughs> so uh, again, in this work, um, oftentimes when we advocate for the arts, I hear the argument of arts are so important. I'd like to just say that I haven't met anyone who doesn't agree with that. People right. agree arts are important. I think we've, we've kind of won that battle. The major concern right now is finding the time and the, the money. So we need to attach ourselves to what is important right now to school leadership, right? So learning loss, SEL. So right now, your directors of specialized learning, your directors of special education, they are immersed in um, finding ways to bring SEL into the classroom. So I would urge all of my arts educator colleagues to connect with them, make sure that they understand and know how you can assist in that learning, that you are already in, the, the SEL work doesn't need to be manufactured or brought in necessarily. There's obvious more supports, but that the art room and the theater classroom and the dance studio are already inherently doing that work. So our entry points and who we're connecting to in the education field, I'd like to send people there uh, as well. I also urge people to go talk to your classroom teachers. So if you are currently in a school, um, I would urge you to go talk to your third grade teacher, to the second grade teacher, to the fifth grade teachers, find out how you can start collaborating this year. You wanna make your, you kinda wanna diversify your talents. So again, not to water down the skill-based work, but to really start to be a resource in your building for how we can uh, maximize our time with our students. And uh, ask to run a PD, ask your, go to your school leadership and ask if you can run a PD. And to those of you out there that are arts administrators or maybe working in culturals, um, same, same for those idea. of us who don't know what a PD is, please explain. A professional development. So all schools have to have weekly professional developments. Sometimes they're called PDs. Sometimes they're called PLCs, professional learning communities. It's typically an hour to two hours after school once a week. And the principals often are the ones who have to design those. And so if you are a teacher or a cultural, a teaching artist, 
uh, offering to run one of those on these topics is both a resource to that school, but also continues to put out that message that the arts are a resource in your school that are often untapped to do this work. I saw uh, in the chat, someone was saying getting parents involved, would that be a good way to do that? You bring parents into something like the, the PCL, the PCL, the PLC? PLC? Parents, yes. I mean, again, you know, the United States is a large place, so possibly this happens. That's not the norm. That par parents are often more involved through PTA in fundraising or advocating for field trips. You know, for post COVID, for field trips, for bringing in guest artists. So, for my partners in arts administration or, or teaching artists, trying to find out and connecting with your parents and your PTA is that is a that is a possible great resource, particularly around. Funding. I love field trips. I've been to the Museum of Fine Art in Houston, Texas. That is during awesome. my high school year it's amazing it is Thank indeed and we want more of them i have a question for you uh uh jen yeah. what are ways we can frame these pd proposals to help fast track them through the administrative red tape so again very you good know, question actually. <laughs> that is a good question and oftentimes principals uh are asked by their district level administration to put forth their plcs or their pd plans a few weeks in advance. So sometimes you can't necessarily fast track, but you can ask what they've already have planned and how can you, so they might have on their schedule an April uh, PLC on SEL. And so ask if you can partner with them or if you can take on leadership of that. So I would first ask what they already have planned and if they don't have- And what's the best time of on. year to approach them with something like this? They're doing this all year. So I, I, would, I would email right now and find okay. out what, what's on their plans and how you can partner with them. Okay. Well, you are a wealth of information and uh, 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 I personally look forward to talking to you some more. Please look her up. She is Dr. Jennifer Katona and she is the president and founder of Three Looms Creative Education. Thank you so much. Thanks so Dr. much. Uh, our next panelist, we have such talent uh, tonight. It's a true it's a it's, uh, hard act to follow. We have Dr. Denny Wolf, uh, a principal researcher at Wolf Brown, an international uh, arts researcher and consulting firm specializing in cultural planning, Wolf Brown is. Wolf focus, focuses on the design, implementation, evaluation, and research that helps communities examine and improve how young people and their families gain access to learning, culture, and creativity in and outside of formal institutions. More recently, she has pioneered evaluation studies and innovative approaches to measurement that build the capacities of schools, cities, and cultural organizations to reflect on how effectively they support young people's development as the next generation of thinkers, innovators, and creators. In short, she's the data lady that brings the stats that help you get your thing on because you can't do it until you can prove that this is working and that is not and what have you. Her biggest questions have always been, whose imagination gets to flourish and whose doesn't? And how do we change that? Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Denny Wolf. Thank you so much, Freddie. Boy, I hope I can live up to that introduction. Erin, uh, can we get the slides? Yeah, so thank you very much for this opportunity and thanks to all of the people, a number of them in the audience, who um, I've worked with over the years and whose um, input and examples and hard work in classrooms and institutions is really the basis for what I'll have to say. So can we get the next one, Erin, please? So um, there's me dressed up <laughs> as an arts hero. Um, and I offer you this because I think it's important for us to understand that we all stand on the shoulders of generations before us. And so um, people who've come before us have really given us legislation, national standards, and a wealth of evidence that um, arts education makes a difference. And particularly that it makes a difference to how children grow up in their social and emotional um, way, forms of development. I would say that we still have major feats of heroism uh, to take on. And I wanna talk a little bit about equity and opportunity, about quality, 
about deeper evidence, about a bigger workforce, and building a big, loud public story for arts education. So next one, please. Um, first and foremost, I think we all have to take responsibility for the fact that the opportunity to be engaged in the arts is in unevenly distributed in this country. Um, every, by every measure in terms of who gets the arts, for how long they get them, whether they get them in and outside of school. So as a rough calculus of that, um, white students are twice as likely to receive arts education as our black and Latino students. We have to look hard at the content of much arts education, not all of it, but much of it, and recognize that the books children read, um, the art they see in museums, um, the performances that they go to, are often taken from a Western canon and don't necessarily give them what the arts have to offer, which is a very wide acquaintance with the cultures, the points of view and the frameworks that are part of being a citizen of a global culture. And then finally, we have to recognize that young people have very different pathways through the arts. If you think about pre-K and then you think about it all the way through the kinds of experiences that Freddie, that Jen, um, that Matt were all talking about, they had a pathway. Um, their elementary school led to their middle school, led to their high school. And that's very uncommon for most students growing up in the US at, at this time. So the first and probably the most important thing I want to say is we all as a community have to confront this uneven distribution of, of opportunity. Next one. Um, and here I want to use an example. Over the last couple of years, I've been working closely with a theater company in New York, the New Victory, following a group of students attending um, schools that had no history of the arts and looking at the impact of the presence of a theater company for the long, long period of three years in which they went to performances, they had residencies, they put on performances. And what we really see in that is very important for how we talk about social emotional learning. Um, we're at a, a very important tipping point. Everybody is now recognizing that the social and emotional um, capacities of kids are the ground on which they become learners, on which they become curious. But if you look carefully at many of the formulations about social emotional learning, they tend to focus on the characteristics of individuals, growth mindset, emotion regulation, or future orientation are characteristics of a person an individual, but if we really think hard about it, social emotional learning has an entirely another side, which is who am I amongst other people and what are my responsibilities to them? So when we ask for the presence of the arts in order to build these kinds of capacities in schools or after schools, we need a much broader, much deeper definition of socio-emotional learning. So understanding the complexity of other people's lives, being curious about the culture and respectful of the culture of other people, or being willing to take action on behalf of others. So second big point, when we say we want the arts in schools for children, we have to think about the arts as a way to develop not only personal characteristics, but interpersonal characteristics. 
and in particular, the ones that have to do with being present for understanding and caring for other people. Um, this, um, the image comes from a remarkable uh, presentation of the magic flute by the Sango Ensemble, um, which you know, is a, an incredible example of how world cultures come together to insist upon a set of human themes and a set of human conflicts and a set of human resolutions. Next one. So third lesson, people often argue that arts education promotes socio-emotional learning. We have to think carefully. It's not a given. Thoughtfully designed, carefully implemented, deeply empathic arts education creates those kinds of capacities in young people. Poor, lousy, slapdash arts education doesn't. So let me give you a tiny example that comes again from the New Victory Spark program. They were studying um, circus arts, in particular, the kinds of things like plate spinning or scarf juggling. But the way the teaching artists taught those skills was in performance side by side with students with um, real attention to the backstories of the acrobats that they were watching and meeting in performance, which talked about the role of effort, of persistence, of failure, and beginning again. In classrooms, kids work together side by side, and teaching artists work with them to think about when somebody's plate goes flying across the room or when somebody can't catch a scarf. Do you laugh or do you help? And what kinds of advice, what kinds of gestures, what kinds of physical proximity actually make for that kind of advice and help? And classes often ended with a moment of reflection among students about what are those capacities and how do you share them with someone else? Point here, we get tremendous socio-emotional learning from the arts, but only if it's so designed. Next one, please, Erin. Um, another example, again, from Spark. Often when we go to collect evidence about whether or not young people's uh, socio-emotional capacities are growing, we oddly turn to exactly the same kinds of tools that we use for testing mathematics or reading comprehension. So we ask students to fill out surveys. But a survey is not a deep measure of whether or not these capacities are taking root. So in Spark, together with teaching artists, we developed other ways of looking at the evidence. So for instance, across the three years, we asked once a year for people, uh, people, kids, also people, um, to fill out a diagram of their theater company, who in their classroom they would put in the role of directors, designers, playwrights, or actors. And what you can see over time is that kids put many more of their classmates in those roles. And often that they understand that the same person could have many of those capacities. Um, and so what you're seeing is a very different understanding of who's my classmate. Um, I'm gonna skip to the next one, Erin, because of time. Um, fourth lesson, we really need uh, a workforce that has the opportunity to think about their own socio-emotional learning. Unless and until we allow teaching artists, 
but also their classroom teachers as partners, also the resource teachers in their classrooms to think about themselves as creative people, as writers, or think about themselves and what they need in order to be patient and understanding and empathetic all day long. Until that's a part of how we train teaching artists, how we train teachers, but also what we offer them in the course of their work days. We don't have the kinds of partners for young people that we need. And also those adults don't grow to flourish and understand in the context of their own lives exactly why the arts are so important for young people. Next one. Ah, so this is the fifth lesson. We need a big, loud story. Um, we have evidence. In many places, we have strong practice, but we do not tell the story loudly and everywhere. So I want us to be able to walk into school lobbies and see displays of on the digital um, monitor of playwriting, dance, sculpture, clay work, whatever it is. I want to see that when kids report cards come home, that there is um, that the comments are not just about math and about reading, as important as those are, but that they include things about drawing, thinking through the arts, um, being able to be part of a choir or a performance. I want city, country, suburban bus stations and uh, transit stops to have huge posters of young people and their work. Uh, I want in school districts that schools profiles that help families to choose which schools their kids may attend include what arts there are, for whom and how long. And then I want us to really go crazy and think about um, bold, funny, humorous things. For instance, a bike brigade that takes kids into the parks with pop-up readings in green spaces this summer. So a big, loud story. So there we go, Freddie. Oh my goodness. I, uh, I particularly loved when you were talking about the collaborative nature of arts ed and how that is inherently SEL only when taught correctly, of course, but that's pretty much true of anything if it's taught badly. I, I my students all the time, <clears throat> I teach music, I teach acting, and I have students all the time complaining to me about their science teachers and their other teachers because they hate the way that they teach and so that they do not learn anything. And uh, uh, yeah, so I was very, very moved by that. And the same, the same question, what can folks do with this information? I think you've already answered in a way. Um, the big loud story part, as you know, resonates heavily with me because I'm trying to create one. Right. And um, that, that is exactly right. I think that if we could take the uh, Art is My Superpower campaign that Arts Hero has put forth, and drive it to schools. I would love, I told you, we earned as many trophies as the sports guys, but our trophies weren't in the big case in the main hall. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what should be happening. It, it really should be. If we if we can push for that, that, that's an awesome thing to try to do and to get kids in general everywhere writing about how art is their superpower and just letting that manifest in them some kind of way. Perhaps that would even move the school boards to start to see how important this is and how it must be funded. Um, uh, thank you so much. I I, uh, uh, I would just tell you that the best thing that happened to me last week is I got a package in the mail. I'm kind of fond of surprises. And my son had printed the art teacher's comments about my granddaughter on the oh. back of a t-shirt. So I have a great t-shirt that says in block letters, Lila has a surreal imagination. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is, how I, old is Lila? 
Uh, Lila is 12 going on 80. Yes. They usually are at that age. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, a lot to Lila and to all those out there. Um, you're lucky to have you for grandma. And, and uh, thank you so much because sure. that inspired me. I hope it inspired everyone else here. And I, I really do. I hope that we can all now get out there and somehow push the big loud story in some kind of way because it is so terribly important that we do that. I mean, uh, as our hero was always saying, we are a what, some $800 billion industry. Everybody loves us. They love what we do and they cry without us. The story is so important to humanity. You turn off somebody's show all of a sudden and they're mad, it's like, oh man, what happened to my show? I mean, but if you look at us as as people, they're like, eh, it's just an actor, eh, it's just a, you know, an arts teacher, a music teacher, whatever. I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't get that great moment without that art teacher. So you don't get to that. You don't get to that soaring film that made you feel and changed your life. I, I did rent people. I get letters from people every day telling me that they did not kill themselves because they saw a Broadway show. So there's no one on earth who can tell me that what we are doing is not effective in every level, on every level of humanity. And when you, that's what you said, the humanity of this, that is what it is. It is the human story. There's only one story, it's us, all of us. And we are all basically one thing. And when you begin to explore that through the arts, then you see your place in the circle of life. You see your place in the story. Even if you're just an extra in this scene, you might be the lead in the next scene, but it, it's, you're a part of the ongoing story. And as we say, there are no small actors. There are no small parts. There are only small actors because you don't get that without that little part, without that walk on, the story doesn't go on. And so uh, um, I'm not gonna babble anymore. I need to get to Michael, mm -hmm. but um, thank you. Thank you so much, thank Danny. You. And, and uh, uh, now I'm going to introduce Michael J. Bobbitt. Uh, he is the executive director of Mass Cultural Council, an arts leader, award-winning director, choreographer, a published playwright and librettist. His work has been produced nationally and internationally. He has adopted works from many popular brands, including Bob Marley's Three Little Birds, one of my favorite songs, Garfield the Musical with Catitude, Jumanji, The Stephen Schwartz Project, Caps for Sale, Make Way for Ducklings, and Blueberries for Sale. Michael has directed slash choreographed at Arena Stage, Ford's Theater, the Shakespeare Theater Company, Olney Company, Studio Theater, Woolly Mammoth Theater, Center Stage, Roundhouse Theater. Where hasn't he gone? Because that would be a shorter list. Sure. The Kennedy Center. <laughs> and previous to Mass Cultural Council, Michael was artistic director of New Repertory Theater and Adventure Theater. His training is from the Harvard Business School Social Enterprise Initiative, Strategic Perspectives in Nonprofit Management, the National Arts Strategies Chief Executive Program, and other notable programs. He has taught theater and dance at Boston Conservatory at Berkeley, George Washington University, Catholic University, Montgomery College, Howard University, and the Washington Ballet. He is a member of the Dramatist Guild of America and the Stage Directors and Choreographers Society. Ladies and gentlemen, the money man, Michael J. Bobby. Thanks. Thank you, Freddie. You forgot to tell people that I'm savage, classy, bougie, and ratchet, too. That's oh, nice. but you didn't tell them. Hey, that wasn't in the bio. It was not in there. <laughs> oh, it's, it's supposed to be there. I would have so. had that with snaps. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, friends, I'm so happy to be here. And thank you to Be an Arts Hero for inviting me. As you can tell, I've been involved in um, in arts for young people for since, since I became a professional artist, uh, specifically on the board of TYA USA and also uh, American Alliance for Theater and Education, which Jen is the president, the chair of. So um, similar to Freddie, I am here because of the arts. It saved me. It saved me from this poor black kid and this poor black family in lower Northwest DC. And the opportunity I got to be on stage the first time was like a light bulb. And so I'm here trying to de dedicate my life to giving back. Um, what's also really interesting is this new job that I have, I'm now a bureaucrat. I now get to give away money to arts organization is a huge, massive change for me. And it's great to be able to affect policy and affect the direction of a state. And hopefully we'll have a lot of national, um, we'll be able to sort of inspire other states nationally with hopefully some great things we can do. Um, I wanted to talk about access in the arts and I don't have a PowerPoint, but I just wanted to chat with you all. For me, the, the, the quintessential thing is that most of us um, work in nonprofits and nonprofits and charities 
were initially created to fill the gap where government could not do it because the government was slammed. And it was built to help the needy and the poor. All over the Bible, help the needy and the poor, help the needy and the poor. So charities were built to do that. And somehow we have lost sight of that. And when we think about access, we are talking about all children, but I want us to really focus in on taking care of those kids that need it the most. The kids that have privilege have a way of getting the arts in different ways. Our brown and black and our BIPOC kids need a little bit more help. The problem that we have is that most of the institutions in this country are predominantly white institutions and they were designed to be predominantly white. Let's not sort of get it twisted. That was the business model that they were built. And I'm not saying that the people that designed it that way are bad people, but they had biases or they had um, specific things that they wanted to see. And so they had white people designing art for white people. And so when we look at trying to build access and having equity in access, we have to redesign the business models which means that we need to infuse the leadership of our organizations with multicultural people rebuilding our business models to multicultural business models. That is the best way we're going to, that's the best tactic we have to sort of fixing um, the problem. And if we go back and think about the access um, and making sure that equity and access is really about taking care of the marginalized, the people that need it the most, the poor and the marginalized, then it becomes a health and human service thing then it becomes no different than providing housing for people that need it or food that for people that need it. And I'm sure we all know that people need art, but it also become, becomes about providing education to people that have lack of education or in areas where the education isn't strong or um, healthcare. So if we think about the arts and access to the arts and equity and access to the arts, we have to think about those people that needed to need it the most and thinking of it as a health and human service aspect. But that means that everyone here and everyone that is a, is a, is a leader in the arts world have to show up to the public square. I'll take Denny's idea even farther. Let's show art, but let's scream loud about it in the public square. We, where's our million artists walk, march on DC? We, our legislators need to hear that. And I get to talk with them every day, all day. And I'm, I'm, as I'm out there in the world talking to our art leaders, I'm saying to them, you have got to put advocacy as a, as a, as a part of your, your staff meetings, your board meetings. You have to get your patrons to also use their voices. We need to use our voices a whole lot more than we're needing it. If not, we run the risk of really damaging the world. The world progresses because of creative thinking and creative thinking comes from exposing kids to the arts. If, they're not, if we have generations of kids that are not exposed to the arts, all the advances we have in technology and medicine will slow down and that will be a threat to the whole world beyond the future of the arts. I mean, who knows what this last year will, will how this last year will damage the arts. But we want to also make sure, as we mentioned before, we want to have future leaders, we want to have future artists and future supporters of the artists. But we also want a whole generation of people that can just think creatively. Because um, I think there are many, many, many more Freddie Walker Browns out there and Michael Bobbitt's out there that maybe won't get a chance because they don't have access to the arts that we're providing. The last thing I will say is that you know, we're in this place because we have been bleeding for a year and many of us are trying to like put a bunch of band-aids on the bleeding to just stop it. But I want us to switch our brain a little bit because, you know, if I lost my wallet and someone returned it to me and the money was gone, if I spent all my time trying to replace the money in the, wa in the wallet, I'm going to be wasting some time. I want us to think about where the next money is for that wallet, right? So, we're a little heavily focused on recovery and I totally get it. What about stimulating the economy? What about stimulating the arts? What about the innovation that we haven't even started to explore in the way digital world and the, um, the, the live performing arts world can integrate? We've been focusing on trying to get back to normal, but I promise you all, we're not going back 
<laughs> we're not going back. The digital world, when, whenever we have advances, advances in technology in the digital world, no one goes back to the old way. You don't see people out there still using eight tracks and CD players and MP3s, right? We have advanced. So what we all need to do as artists, as creative thinkers, is dig in to the digital world and, expo and, ex and explore all the opportunities we have there. We're seeing how the digital world has expanded our access to the arts. So why would we go back? Let's go further into it and see what more we can do and how more we can use that. Um, and the last thing I would say is, is as if anyone's struggling with, uh, with why are we doing this? To me, anti-racism and access to the arts is an act of love. And I just challenge you to think about what side of history you wanna be on when this is all said and done in 50 years. Thank you, Freddie. Oh, thank you, Michael. By the way, I have a, <laughs> I have a great rent story I need to tell you at some point. Okay, I, I look forward to it. Um, I, I it, it, it's so hard because, as you know, I'm very passionate about all of this, and so sometimes it's it's hard to just express articulately how much what you're saying means and how important it really is when we get to a place where everything is just blown down. There is no point in trying to just patch it. You might as well just start brush it off if the foundation is still there and then rebuild because and build, as they say, build back better. I don't mean to be political, but you, you, it just doesn't make sense to keep trying to do the same thing, old thing, the same way and expect different results. The definition of insanity. Now is the time for bold thinking. Now is the time to make big changes, particularly in education in general. It really is. We, it, we, we have to get to a place where we are brave enough to speak truth to power in that way. And I know that, you know, as a, as a bureaucrat, you can speak to how, you know, slowly the wheels can grind. And that is part of what we are trying to do because when you talk about the money, it's always, well, what am I spending the money on? What am I getting for the money? The, we want to find a way to take our big loud story and start showing the results, the actual results of what happens when you invest in these communities, when you invest in arts education, what happens with these children? Do they improve or don't they? And there's so many stats, as Denny was saying, that back this up, but we have to show it. We have to get out there and actually show it somehow. And, and how is something that I am working on and I'm hoping that everyone here will be working on tonight. Uh, do you have any concrete actions you can give people to take right now and into yeah. how to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so going back to normal to me would be a massive failure. I mean, we know that our our whole industry is vulnerable. Our nonprofit process and the models that we've been using are vulnerable. Uh, but to go to your to your question, um, I legislators will listen when we organize and when we're loud enough. They will listen. They have to listen. Um, we provide votes for them. And so if we can somehow organize and be heard in the public square, they will listen. Um, but, but don't um, underestimate the power of an email or a phone call or um, a letter. Or lots of them. Yeah, I mean, I know that sort of uh, what I've heard in my state, if you get four or five letters as a legislator, then it has to be moved up the chain and something has to be done about it. But four only four or five? Or five? Letters, four or five letters makes, means you have to pay attention more. Less than wow. that. Less That's than a that. low bar. Yeah, less than that means, because that four or five represents four or five hundred, you know? That right, may but I'm the, saying that's a low bar. Surely low each bar. one of us can get four or five people that we know to write a letter, including our own. Yep. That's a very low bar. So, yep. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm in the process of advocating for a lot of money right now from the stimulus packet, from I mean, from the federal relief packet, but also from state money as well. And I'm I'm looking forward to working with Denny, who's a fellow Cambridgean. I don't know if they even know if that that's what it means, but but people here to help me make sure that our legislators are hearing. So friends, that's why you have a vote. Get out there and make your votes heard. Well, we have just chatted up all of our time. We have a few questions though. Uh, I think we're gonna open it up to the panel. We have a few questions that I know people have been sending in as we've been going along. And so they are very excellent questions. Um, Wendy has a question. She's curious what our panels and participants think wait, 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 don't move it, uh, about the school <laughs> that school models in some states where there are arts programs, 
but they're part of university interscholastic leagues and they have competition components as part of the curriculum. Uh, panel, would you like to weigh in on that? speak to that i you know personally my philosophy is i'm not a fan of competitive theater when ensemble is at the core of theater i don't even really like auditioning <laughs> as a competitive form of theater uh, so i'm not philosophically aligned to competitions but i do think that i know particularly down south that is a big part of that so i think it's just how we frame and reframe the purpose of our work with our students so if we're still committed to doing the quality work and process over product in our classrooms and then our performance is the competition and we approach it in a way that is still ensemble based and around the the work of the child and why we do arts education i have no problem with that as an alignment but i think if we start to get com into that competitive nature i think that brings out a lot of the ugliness that um the arts and kind of the the business can um provide and, and I don't think that's healthy for anybody. Just one comment on top of that. Competition can be very destructive in that way, but it is a public system which allows many, many students who would not have a good trumpet or would not have the clothes to be in our audition or would not have the bus ticket to go to Allstate. And we could do away with the competition, but hang on to guaranteed public access for kids. And as a, as a lifelong actor who's done nothing but auditions, I did two today, I do them all the time. I really want this to be understood. Actors are not in competition with one another. We're trying to work, that's all. It's a job interview. That's all an audition is. It's a job interview. It's like any other job interview. And we have to get to the place where kids understand you don't win all the time. You don't get trophies for everything. You have to try and you have to do your very best. And if you don't get the trophy or the reward or whatever, then whatever. You did your best. You did the show. You did your performance. And that is what we're concentrating on. But the idea that, you know, everything is a competition. It's not, it really actually is not. So yes, Jen, when we do competitions, we must phrase them like, you know, we, we used to say this, right? Didn't we used to say, uh, uh, oh, what was that phrase? Come on, somebody help me. The phrase where like, if you didn't, you know, being a gracious winner and a, and a uh, uh, or a gracious Shall winner, a gracious winner. winner. A what's that expression? A, grace, a graceful wound and a shallow loser. No, goal. that's not the one, but you, you guys don't know what I'm talking about. There's an expression about how the point of sports and the point of games and all this kind of stuff is to no, learn how to win. Yeah. Right, no, and how to lose in life, because that is what life is actually going to give you. So uh, um, competition gets ugly, but that is not, I don't want anybody to think that that's what the business is all about. It's actually really not. Uh, um, there's some yeah. other ugly components to the business, but that's not one of them. <laughs> yeah, there, are, there are other ways to inspire kids to do their very best outside of labeling winners, because when you label someone a winner, other people may be labeled a loser. And what does that do to the other kids? So there's harm that can be done when you when you have competitions. There is harm that can be done, but I think they're necessary. And this is a debate we'll have another time. Because in the end, I mean, what is sports? What is all that? Somebody wins, somebody loses. That is life. And that is a lesson that we have stopped teaching. And it is to our detriment because then when kids get out there, when they grow up and they realize, oh, I'm actually not winning all the time. It's like, that's right. And then they want to go and explode on people. That's not good. That has to be built too from the beginning that you don't always win and that is uh but that doesn't mean you don't stop working and it doesn't mean that you don't keep going that is something we have to start reteaching again uh, um but that's me that's i'm sorry that's just me going off on a little tangent let me get to the next question because we are over our time and you guys are also very interesting um whitney asks as someone with experience in public ed how do you get past the ideology that sees school's purpose as solely career path we get it that the school is the place to make great change, but how do we convince those that think that arts are only for leisure? I love that question. I think the best way to tackle ide ideological thinking is to have new ideas. So what are the new ideas that you, you can then fight and use to institutionalize? You know, in theater, we have many ideas that have created racist structures in our industry, like Shakespeare is the pinnacle of theater, like if you haven't achieved Shakespeare, you're not a great actor. 
that's an idea that someone had, right? Or, or, or theater started in Greece, that's an idea. So if the idea is that you have to be on this, this pathway, can we create another idea that's more about workforce development, getting kids ready to get out into the field to combat um, co college readiness? Just needs more ideas. Yeah, I would also, I would, um, I would point to the, I've been pointing a lot to the inauguration lately. We were a country that needed to heal and our leaders brought out artists, right? J-Lo, Amanda Gorman, Lady Gaga, um, the country singers. We just, we celebrated and many of the, much of the country sighed relief. Yet we are quick to then turn around and not recognize that those people, those artists started in after school programs and community based programs and in their schools. And so those are viable careers that a, an artistic identity is not something you create in college, but something you create much earlier on. And so the more we can continue to talk about that, um, I think is really important. That's part of our advocacy work and part of the rigor of our curriculum. Um, so the more that we as the the folks in the school. I think to Denny's point, I'm making a big, loud story, big mm -hmm. storytelling and getting that out on your on your bulletin boards and trying to get into your your school's weekly announcements and just making yourself more visible um, and less kind of apologetic. And sometimes we're, well, we'll I'll do, I'll take anything you can give me, the hallway, the stairwell, uh, and really start to um, speak to our rigor and discipline. I think that that all helps. Well, uh, yep. to jump in, oh, Denny, please go ahead. No, I would be quick. Uh, I think we need a much bigger tent for arts education. There's sound engineering, there's lighting, there's an int lesson yeah. until we acknowledge that those are all our kids and those are all of them we should be advocating for. We've cut ourselves off from the tens and thousands. Design technology, I'm, I'm, I'm a drum major with a specialization in design technology. And it really helped me through. Stage makeup's not my favorite deal, but I'm still learning. <laughs> Excellent, sweetheart. I have another question here. I have a question that says, if we are immigrants and cannot vote, how can we support? That is a question I will speak to directly. You can get the people you know who can vote. You can always get somebody to register vote. That is one thing that I think we should all do all the time. Try to get, I try to get two people to register to vote every voting cycle, at least two. Try to get somebody you know to register to vote who can vote. That can help you because they're gonna vote, hopefully in your interest, you see what I mean? And that's just very important. That alone can start the ball rolling. Even if you can't vote, you can help other people vote. You can help people get to the polls. You can help people register to vote. You can do whatever you can to make sure that voting is something that the people around you are doing even if you yourself cannot do it. Anybody else? Got anything for that? Yeah, you can still make your voice heard. You can still have action, action steps to get us equitable and make sure arts are well funded and well supported. That's all the questions that I have, and we are over our time. Um, uh, I'll turn it back over to Matt to close. Thank you all so much. Our panel was so amazing. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Denny. Thank you, Jen. I, I look forward to staying in touch with all of you. And um, uh, I, I learned a lot this evening and I hope we, that we all did. Matt, you wanna take us home? Yes, uh, thank you everybody. And thank you, Freddie. This was an incredible panel. This is the tip of the iceberg for arts education. There's so much more to learn and there's so much more to do to be civically engaged and to get our schools to respond to what we all, I mean, this, this million arts worker march idea. Um, and I like it. Arts education, a plank to that is absolutely essential. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about this being the first conversation of many in terms of uh, what, what's being dialogued here about arts education. Uh, if you wanna find out more, please email info at beanartshero.com and uh, go to beanartshero.com to learn more about the different initiatives that we're working on. There will be more town halls. We of course are working on the Dawn Act. We've been a part of a New York Revive and Rebuild. We're trying to get uh, state money and create blueprints so that each state can get uh, money from the $350 billion allocation from the American Rescue Plan. And there are many ways to get involved. Email us for more information. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining tonight. This is incredible. Uh, any last words from the panelists or from Freddie before we break? Be an arts hero. 
Thanks. Being arts hero. Being arts hero. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful Thank you. evening. Take the care, everyone. The power of arts and culture. I know. Our, our, new, our new deal is arising.